Well, perfect. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Guido Appenzeller. I'm from a company called VMware that uh, actually makes open, uh, OpenStack products. We, we really like OpenStack, um, contrary to some, some popular beliefs. Um, but I wanna, what I want to talk about here today is actually networking. And, and very specifically, currently, the very way we do networking in data centers and enterprises and almost any kind of organization is fundamentally changing. And I want to walk you through a couple of the changes that I'm seeing. And I mostly want to talk about what's changing in the industry, not about any particular product. Uh, at the very end, I want to have one slide where I talk a little bit about what we're doing with NSX to address these, these challenges. But um, the main part is really about the revolution that's happening in networking right now. Before I jump into that, let me actually talk about a different revolution. And that's the revolution in compute. Right? So we're currently in the moving from sort of a client server model to a cloud model. And that's only the second time in history that we're really fundamentally changing how we're delivering IT. Right? So we started out with this idea of uh, you know, all kinds of random computers, and then mainframes emerged as the first widely uh, adopted model. Right? And this was basically one big monolithic system, one company making the silicon, making the system, making the software on top, everything vertically integrated, probably sold to you by a friendly IBM rep with a red tie and a black suit. Um, but then the client-server revolution happened. Right? And this, these vertically integrated systems um, started coming apart. Right? Suddenly, I could take an Intel CPU in a Dell system you know, with Windows on top, alternatively an AMD CPU, you know, an HP system with Linux. And I could mix and match these. There's no longer a particular software tied to a particular hardware. And that completely changed how we did compute. Right? There was this Cambrian explosion of, of uh, creativity, and basically all the modern software companies you know, sort of started uh, during this time. And now we're yet again in a different change of the, the compute model. Right? We're moving from the, the idea of client service, where I necessarily have to operate the whole stack, to a model where now the hardware may be operated by somebody else, and I'm just consuming it as a service, putting my own software on top. Right? That's what we typically call cloud. This can be private clouds. Say I'm running an OpenStack cloud on premise, but I'm automating it so the end consumer doesn't have to worry about hardware anymore. Or um, it's a public cloud you know, where I go to Amazon and sign up for a service, and they're doing all of this for me. So this change in how structurally IT is delivered had huge implications on us. Right? If uh, 1996, I was a grad student back then, uh, you know, I was setting up servers. And back then, how would you set up a server? So you would take your terminal, you would with a serial cable, you would plug that into uh, the server, you take a CD. Does anybody remember these round silver things? Right? You know, had the had the OS distro on it. <laughs> Exactly, and it had, the, they had the, uh, uh, the OS on it, and that would probably take me two to three hours before I had a, a server up and running. Right? Today, when I go to a, a private cloud, and, uh, you know, like, like uh, OpenStack, or I go to Amazon, right, this is down to minutes. I pick an image, I say spin up this image, and a few minutes later I have a running server. Right? It's unbelievable how much better this has made our lives. And uh, the, the amount of productivity gained during that time, there are some studies by Gartner, it's just, you know, uh, the typical server administrator has gone 10 times as productive, um, you know, uh, over a period of about 10 years. So it made huge progress. So that's compute. Um, what I want to talk about here, though, is networking. In networking, we started with exactly the same model, right? Classically, even today in many cases, right? If you buy a piece of networking equipment, it's a box, you know, Chip is from one vendor, system is from one vendor, software is from the same vendor. Right? You know, until a few years ago, that was probably still the dominant model of how, of how networking was delivered. Right? Um, and the fact that the model, that the technology stack, like the, the, the way how we build systems didn't change during the time, had a profound impact on, on how we run networks. Right? If I go back to my grad student days, right, 1996, uh, if I wanted to configure a switch, it would look pretty similar to configuring a server back then. Right? I would uh, telnet and then uh, you know, type, type CLI commands until I had the network configured. Each switch managed separately. And then you compare that to, 2000, uh, to 2010, or maybe many organizations still today, pretty much nothing has changed. Right? You still connect to that switch and you manually configure these network element by network element, a, way that's a method that's highly error prone, right? um, very, very inefficient. Um, there's actually one thing that changed. We went from Telnet to SSH, right? But that is pretty much the innovation in, uh, in, you know, in the network management of a, you know, over a decade here or 15 years. Right? It's very sad. Now, somewhere around 2010, 
slowly the monolithic networking um, uh, sort of systems that we built were starting to come apart, right? Where basically the chips were suddenly coming from merchant silicon vendors. Right? Broadcom today is the, is the dominant one. They're sort of the intel of the networking world. And the software started to become separately from the hardware, right? There's different models for that. There's, uh, you know, there's sort of the, the model that um, uh, the folks from uh, uh, Verizon were talking about when they were talking here, right, where you take a company like Big Switch, right, that provides software that runs directly on the switches, right, bare metal switching. There's another model where you say, let's actually mo move this into the hypervisor, right, let's have a neutron plugin of some type that, uh, you know, talks to the hypervisors, and then, you know, with something like OVN or, or NSX, we can create a network overlay um, that solves this problem. So in uh, 2008 to 2010, I was actually at Stanford as a professor, and I ran a little project there called uh, OpenFlow. And uh, we had Kate Green visiting. She was a reporter from the MIT Technology Review. And she asked us how we call this, this general movement, this general idea. And we were like, well, what general movement? This is like a research project. She's like, no, no, there's something bigger here, right? This is, this is really changing how we do networking. And she, at that time, was writing about software-defined radio. She was like, it's kind of the same thing. So she called it software-defined networking. And that is sort of stuck as the term for this revolution in how we do networking, right? And it can be network virtualization or bare metal switches with software on top of it. I think for me, the key thing is the separation between hardware and software. These two things coming apart, that gives you as a user choice to swap them out you know, in any way that you want. And I think this SDN revolution at this point, I think it has succeeded, right? I mean, the, you know, we're seeing some of the, the very early companies have gotten pretty big. We're probably this year. I mean, if, at least if you extrapolate past growth linearly, right, you would expect this year the first products to hit the billion dollar annual revenue run rate, so, or at least bookings run rate. So these are like some big changes that are happening here, right, and where, where these technologies are going mainstream. And I think until recently, my thinking was, well, that's probably it, right? So, and SDN revolution is done, SDN is winning, we're going to do networking software, great. And then I sort of, you know, drew this, this diagram here and was like, there's something not quite right with this. <laughs> it seems like we're actually not done. There's one logical step that has to follow this, which is that the, the current way we do SDN is really still focused on the classic client-server compute model. Right? It's not yet really optimized for cloud. So I think there will be a next step. And uh, let me call this uh, sort of cloud mobile networking. And you know, before anybody protests, I'm going to admit here, um, that is sort of the mother, mother of all buzzwords, right? I mean, <laughs> but let, let me try to make an honest attempt here to convince you that something is structurally changing again in how we're going to do networking in the future. Right? And uh, let, me, let me start this out by giving you a very concrete, tangible example. So um, when I was making the slides of an earlier draft of this presentation, I was actually sitting at Starbucks you know, and uh, working on my laptop and uh, was working on the slides as well as on an Amazon demo we were building at that time. And if you think about what's happening on the network when I'm working there, right? Um, oops. Here we go. So I did a, did a little network trace, right? And, and here's, the, here's the network trace. You know, so basically, my packets go from my local Starbucks in Menlo Park. They, they go into the uh, you know, Comcast network, which turns out to be Starbucks um, service provider. And uh, from there, the Comcast apparently peers directly with Amazon. And now we're in the Amazon network, right? This friendly gentleman here is actually Bas Geyer. He's uh, the CIO of VMware, right? So he runs all of our networks. Um, which of these switches or routers that we see in this path are actually under his control? Well, not a single one of them, right? It's Starbucks networks or Comcast networks or Amazon networks. But if data leaks out, you know, or if somebody somehow uses my communication there to compromise the VMware systems, uh, he will still get fired for it, right? <laughs> That's the unfair world of today. So, and this is kind of interesting, right? Because we now have a CIO who's responsible for networking over network systems where he doesn't control a single one of them. He doesn't control any piece of hardware, right? And that's certainly different from, I think, how I had thought about networking in the past, right? So, so that for me really is the difference, that in the future, right, when we think about networking for, for public clouds, for private clouds, for multiple clouds, for mobile devices, right? we're talking about networking where you don't even control the hardware anymore, where you're running on somebody else's hardware. And that makes a big difference in terms of how you run and how you operate networks. Okay. So in this sort of brave new world, I mean, there's some people who are saying, look, we probably don't need network level 
controls it all anymore. Like just assume all traffic is untrusted. You know, you, you're going to have application level uh, layer access control. You need an authenticator for each and every service you want to use, you know, whether you're a user or you're an automated process. And with that, all the networking problems go away. Everybody can be on the public internet. Right? I think there's some truth to that in the sense that I think sort of uh, authenticated connections will become much, much more prevalent. Uh, you know, in this world, and then sort of encrypting them, running them over SSL. Um, that being said, I think it's naive to think that there's sort of this idea alone, this idea of saying, you know, every connection between, say, a web tier and an app tier now has, a, has an authentication credential, that that alone will automatically lead to a secure architecture. Right? Because imagine, you know, somebody hacks into, uh, yeah, here's a little key. Imagine somebody hacks into, uh, you know, one of your, your web servers, right? So what can they do? Right? Assuming this is sort of, you know, you're running in, in a cloud or you're running in your data center. So first of all, I mean, the first thing you're going to do is they're going to turn off every security mechanism you've, you have running inside that instance. Right? Um, secondly, they can start scanning the network. Like, let's sniff some traffic. Let's see what traffic is passing around here. Let's probe. Let's scan ports. Um, you're not going to see any of this because, you know, all your security is now at the application layer. Right? So this, this will all fly under your radar. Um, if you manage to compromise two servers, they can now communicate freely and you won't see it anymore, right? Because it's just going to completely bypass any application layer security. Um, but, but even without that, right, uh, he can find out what versions of servers or frameworks do you have running on the other things. He can wait for uh, a vulnerability. You know, if, if a new application layer vulnerability comes out, maybe use that to, to jump around. Um, the beauty about network layer security is not that it's, it's fundamentally different what you could hypothetically do with it from, from what you can do at the application layer. The beauty of network instead of layer security, in my opinion, is that it's really a completely separate trust domain. Right? If your application gets compromised, you can rely on the fact that your, that your network layer security is still the same as before. Right? And that's a big deal, right? because that, that just means you can have much cleaner security architectures. You know how to think about your systems in, in scenarios where, uh, you know, where you have a compromise. Um, you know, and the, this is not only blocking connections, this is also just seeing what's going on, right? If you have two web servers and a web tier, they suddenly have a port 22 connection between them, there's probably something funky going on, right? This is not supposed to happen uh, in, a, in a normal network. So there's a second big change in, uh, in how we're doing networking security in this brave new world, and that is that the way we do network security Classically, is with middle boxes, with firewalls, right? You, you buy a big appliance, you plug it in, you run all your traffic through it. And in, in, a, in a world of sort of, you know, large clouds with sort of distributed apps and a lot of east-west traffic, that doesn't scale anymore. And um, let, me, let me explain to you a little bit what I mean here. So today, the sophisticated attackers that we have, right, they, they're no longer doing sort of the typical drive-by, you know, smash and grab kind of attacks of the past, but they typically take their time, right? They find some way to go through your perimeter firewall and get into initial virtual machine, right? And they do this with a zero-day exploit, by social engineering. We've seen cases where they physically broke into an office just to get a security key, just in order to infect one server, right? to, get the, to get across the firewall. Once they're inside, um, they're pretty, pretty smart about this. They lay low, they put, uh, you know, deploy sleeper payloads in place, their, their primary one gets, gets discovered. They start sniffing, they start um, you know, probing. Uh, eventually, they figure out a way how to comprom uh, compromise additional servers, and they're typically active for months before they're being found. Right? So how can you protect against these type of attackers? And you can do this by saying, look, um, I think we can just build such a good perimeter firewall, we'll never have a compromised server again. It's probably not going to work. Right? It's not a sound strategy. Uh, a better idea is to say, let's stop the attacker from moving around laterally inside the network. And you know, the, the naive approach to that is to say, like, hey, let's just put firewalls everywhere. Let's run every single packet to a firewall. Right? And in, uh, if you look at it, sort of the, 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 the bandwidth required, to that, for, uh, required for that in a modern data center is just no longer possible. Right? Let, me, let me give you some concrete numbers here. So let's assume for a second we want to do this with classic physical firewalls. Right? Um, if we put a firewall on every server, this means every, byte, every, every packet of east-west traffic runs to a firewall. So if I pick a spine switch, every packet through that spine switch needs to go through a firewall. So let's just take for one spine switch, let's figure out how many firewalls do we need to firewall all the traffic. Right? So this is a pre pretty big spine switch, uh, Arista 7508. It uh, has about 22 terabits, or 23, 23 terabits of capacity. Right? 
So quiz, how many firewalls do I need to firewall all the traffic through the switch? Anybody want to guess? No? So uh, I went to the Palo Alto homepage, and this is of the biggest firewall, at least until recently, you could buy from Palo Alto. That can do about 120 gigabits. I think you see the problem, right? So uh, you know, I did the math, and um, you know, it turns out uh, you would need 192 firewalls. <laughs> Imagine this, right? You have your one spine switch, and you have racks and racks and racks and racks and racks of firewalls. What really kills me is uh, you know, the 500, uh, 500 kilowatt power consumption. So you can either power a small subdivision, <laughs> or you can, you can uh, uh, you know, firewall your traffic through one of your spine switches. So we're at a point where the amount of east-west traffic that we're seeing in a modern data center makes it completely impossible to do this with classic hardware firewalls. So we have to move this up into the software layer. There's just no other choice anymore. It's, it's very simple. So one thing that came with these new networks that have to run you know, um, uh, uh, you know, across uh, multiple domains is the rise of overlays. Right? And the, the idea of an overlay is very, very simple. Um, you, know, you, you're, you have your physical network uh, at the bottom. Then you create some kind of abstraction on top. I, we like to call it a network hypervisor, but uh, you can call it whatever you want. And then basically, you, on top of that, you're able to build essentially arbitrary network topologies that you can custom tailor for each and every application. Right? And you can, uh, depending on what software you use, at the very least, you can sort of create the equivalent of a VLAN, so a private network. You probably have an equivalent of a router, right? Um, you may have equivalent of a firewall, maybe stateless or stateful. You may have a distributed load balancer, you know, additional um, VPN capability, integration for physical switches. It depends a little bit what, what solution you're using. But, but this idea of, of having overlays um, I think it's architecturally actually not very nice, right? You know, you're stacking headers. That seems like a bad idea. But I think it's actually here to stay. If you look at it, pretty much all the modern solutions in this space um, are using overlays to some degree. And uh, you know, whether it's a, a Cisco ACI or VMware NSX or, or pretty much everybody else in the industry. Um, so I think they're not going to disappear. I think they have become a fundamental architectural component of a modern network architecture. So that was of a quick run through of what's changing in, in networking. Let me talk a little bit about what's changing on the application side. Because as our infrastructure changes, applications are adapting to that. And I think the biggest observation there is that an application today is a distributed system. I think how uh, uh, Martin Casado, a friend of mine, phrased it is that the, the application has become the network, right? that this is really driving the network. So, so imagine right, you're, you're sitting in the audience and say you're tweeting about this presentation. What happens on the back end? Right, the tweet gets sent up to Twitter. We have some kind of REST API. You know, it gets replicated. It gets indexed for searching. and gets backed up. It gets, you know, goes in some massively parallel infrastructure. Probably your traffic runs to firewalls and load balances along the way. Right? This is a very, very complex process. And, and this is today pretty much the case with any modern application. Right? If you could do your, your banking portal or something like that, it's exactly the same thing. Right? This talks to a lot of different, different back end, both third-party services as well as components that were written by your bank. Now, with the architecture of an application changing, we're starting to see the infrastructure change that supports these applications. And it seems like the, the, the architecture of choice that's emerging is this idea of microservices together with containers as the infrastructure construct to, to support these microservices. So the basic idea is I'm, uh, you know, instead of having these, these old-fashioned tiers, I'm now basically saying, OK, I have microservices. They can all talk to each other, or at least a subset can. There's a matrix who can talk to whom. Um, they all have a very clearly defined API, typically REST. And uh, you know, then basically I can I, I compose an application out of a, a set of microservices. If you drill a little deeper inside one of these microservices, they usually have some kind of container scale-out group you know, um, that, that scales up and down with, with built-in redundancy. And in front of that, I have a load balancer that distributes my traffic um, to these containers, probably with a firewall to make sure I can only reach those, those parts that I should be able to reach, and that somehow connects to your router that, uh, uh, that, that runs the network. Often, this is also sitting behind NAT. Um, for security reasons, but also just because we actually now some of our, the largest customers that we have, they're having problem with IP-based exhaustion, that even on their internal 10 slash 8 network, they don't have enough IP addresses for all their containers anymore. So, uh, that's, uh, so NAT is, is pretty common here. So if you put together the internal container architecture plus the 
the, the sort of this, this overall microservice architecture, you run into a couple of interesting security challenges, right? And uh, let, me, let me sort of point out one, one, one very simple one. So if you, uh, let's assume you're running containers, you know, on a farm, farm of containers, you know, maybe use Docker or Kubernetes or, or Mesosphere, and you will mix and match containers from different apps just for efficiency, right? You don't want to have stranded capacity. Then currently the isolation between these containers tend to be fairly weak, right? The, if I can, if I'm an attacker and I manage to break into one of the containers, there's a couple of things I can do, right? In most container applications today, there's actually no network, no real network isolation between these different containers on the same host. So I can just, for example, you know, hop over um, to, the, to the next container here. Um, the other thing I can do is I can say, look, uh, the isolation of containers today is primarily done via the Linux kernel. And uh, so if I can find a uh, Linux kernel vulnerability that allows me to do the right type of privilege escalation, I actually can take over the entire container host. And that's very, very bad, right? Because that allows me to take over all containers, sniff the network, suddenly have access to the BIOS, I can try to hide there, right? It gives me a lot of different tools um, as an attacker that I can try out. You know, once I'm, I've compromised them, I can actually get to the data in the back end and exfiltrate all of this, uh, you know, out of the network. So today, in the enterprise, which is, uh, you know, that we're mostly serving to, I would say 100% of container deployments I know actually run inside of virtual machines, right? It's not because they use the virtual machines for scheduling. They have probably one virtual machine per server. But it's because they basically want the VM layer underneath as an additional layer of security. Right? Once you have that, you can then use that layer also to provide network security. So put a virtual switch in, inside the network, right? Or maybe OVS inside your, your, your KVM host. Put firewalls there, and now if an attacker um, breaks into your system, then they can still compromise an initial container, right? But when they then try to go on from there, and uh, here we go, um, then basically they will be blocked by the firewall. More importantly, I can detect that they're trying to do this. I can do things like, for example, taking them and, and mapping them to a honeypot in, the, you know, that's sort of in my security backend. Um, or I can, you know, sort of start running scanning tools on these containers, right, to see if, if I can understand what's happening there and, and what's bad. So basically, I'm, I suddenly have all these tools that we developed in a classic data center I can now use for containers if I have a network virtualization layer underneath. So I think, from my observations, I think this will be the future. I think this will be the typical way how we run containers, at least in, in, uh, in, in a typical enterprise, right? If you're running hyperscale, different rules apply, but in enterprise, I think this is the, going to be the typical model. So what does it mean overall for networking, right? So I have my overall microservice architecture. Now my developer deploys a new microservice, and how the network works at the microservice level is probably going to be driven by the developer, right? He's going to figure out, okay, I have one virtual IP or several virtual IPs, how are they going to map back to, to the internal um, containers in my service? You know, what, what kind of load balancing they want to use, what kind of firewall they want to use, what ports need to be open, what kind of backend connections can they do? And that's sort of one type of networking. Let's call this developer networking for a second, or, or maybe app-level networking. But then there's also the question, of how do I tie together all these, these microservices, right? If you're running, say, a bank, right? A typical bank today has, say, five to 10,000 applications, right? Let's assume the future they turn into, you know, five to, to 20,000 microservices. Um, the developer builds the individual microservice, but then how these microservices, which microservices can talk to each other, you know, right? If we want to divide them up a little bit and say, well, these are sort of extremely sensitive ones. They can only be accessed from inside the organization. These are ones that are open to the outside world, right? Um, that's a task that's probably still going to be up to the central IT department that's sort of figured out how to, how to coordinate all these things. So I think we're going to have two levels of networking. We're going to have a developer networking, uh, you know, like to creating the application network, and then we have the IT department creating the Let's call it, you know, inter-app network or the, the enterprise level network. Right? And, uh, you know, just to make it a bit more interesting, we're now seeing actually customers that have a, a third level of networking. So we have the app level network from the developer. We have the enterprise network that connects together the microservices or apps from the, from the enterprise sort of networking team. And then we have the hardware team that runs underneath, right? And I have not actually seen a customer that has an overlay over an overlay over an overlay, but I've seen the two combinations of the upper two or the lower two. So I'm expecting the all three uh, at any time, right? So for example, you're on, this will be like a Kubernetes with, uh, with a networking you know, on top of an NSX, on top of an ACI, right? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. If you, if you see one, please let me know. But I, I predict this will, be, will happen pretty soon. 
And I think at the end of the day, having you know three levels of encapsulation on the network is probably a really bad thing. We don't want that. And, and hopefully we'll get to architectures where actually all three can be driven through one control plane. But I think what is here to stay is this idea that different parts of your organization want to effectively configure and manage different layers of your network. And that'll make our life, in terms of running networks, more complicated. So what does all of this mean for OpenStack? So if you talk to a, a modern enterprise today, you know, what I'm hearing a lot is that actually they're looking at VMware, they're looking at OpenStack to run their on-premise data centers. But there's also this thing called public clouds, right? The Amazons and the Azures of the world, yeah? which uh, I think both with an OpenStack hat on or, or a VMware hat on, and we're a little bit not entirely happy about this, this thing drifting away, but I think it's a fact of life, right? It's gonna be, it's gonna be there, the customers are doing it, and, and it's, it's gonna be, become very, very common. So, you know, I talked to one customer in, in uh, Europe, and they basically said, look, um, you know, there was one business unit that built an application on Amazon. It works really great. It's here to stay. We have another one that built one on Azure. You know, they wanted the Office 365 integration. Um, uh, we built our stuff with IBM, the soft layer. And, uh, you know, then they have, I believe they have both VMware and OpenStack in their, in their enterprise data center. It's like, okay. Um, and now they have an, an audit coming up, you know, security audit. But one of the checkboxes is show a coherent firewalling policy across your entire IT infrastructure. They're like, what does this even mean, right? We have completely different silos, right? Where basically the security configuration is different, the development teams are different, you know, it's, it's, they, they, they're very, very different in terms of how you operate them. How do we show that something is, is common, right? So I think what these companies are looking for right now and where there's a big need is basically any kind of infrastructure that allows them to manage and control, you know, the basic aspects of a data center across these different silos, right? And so very specifically on the networking side, right, have something that allows them to build a network that's not only within a particular cloud, but, you know, that allows them to, to manage networking in Amazon versus Azure versus OpenStack, you know, versus VMware, all in a coherent way. Yeah. And like any sort of abstraction layer, it's never going to support all the bells and whistles that each of these clouds uh, offer, but at least it's going to be a common denominator that allows me to, to treat them in a more homogeneous way. So everything I said so far is really about the, the, the data center part of networking. The one I'm actually not going to talk much about here is the, the mobile part, right? Because where classically your users came in via a plug that was on your, on your campus network, right? Those days are over. Today they're with a laptop on wireless, maybe not even your wireless. Um, they're busy coming in as untrusted. So, so part of the task there is that in order to run a network, you need to take all these connections that come in and then basically tease them apart and map them to the right networks internally. Right? If, at least if you want to use networks in any way, shape, or form for access control. So for example, saying, hey, if he has a mobile device, if the user is part of the sysadmin group, right, well, then he's allowed to make SSH connections to certain backend systems. If he's in the call center group, then he's not allowed to do that. Right? And uh, you know, in, in, in reality, we have now some customers at VMware where this is actually has a lot more granularity, right? But depending on uh, you know, you have, for example, a VDI desktop, and there's a you know, huge list of Active Directory groups you can be a member of, and based off that, you get very different firewall rules of who you can talk to on the back end. Right? And so the, figuring out how to manage this complexity, I think, will be a big part of, of networking uh, in the future. So let me talk briefly about what we are doing as, as VMware. Um, so we, at VMware, we have a product called, called NSX. Right? It's, a, it's basically a network virtualization layer. It uh, uh, works with KVM, it works with VMware, um, vSphere. Uh, we have Hyper-V on our roadmap. Um, it also works with containers. So if you want to plug this under Docker or Pivotal Cloud Foundry or something like that, that that's, that's fine as well. Right? Um, we announced it's going to work with public clouds. So we're going to support them as endpoints. Right? We have integration with virtual desktops, where you can for example, use the, the Active Directory example right, from, from your virtual desktops or your mobile devices. And, you know, working with on other things such as Internet of Things and integrating so branch offices for, for retailers or, or, uh, or outlets for retailers. And the, really where we see this developing is that, you know, in the future, running networks and running IT will mean you have all these different types of endpoints and you're trying to understand and manage traffic across them, right? Any solution is just part of one particular cloud. It's going to be a piece and 
for your overall network solution, you need adapters into that. But in, it in itself is just no longer sufficient to really solve the problems that typically today a network organization in a large enterprise has. And you know, for all of these, I think it'll be very important to figure out how can you build a solution that, that gives you a high degree of automation, right? Because I think the only way how you can, uh, can be efficient in a modern IT organization is by, by automating everything. You want to have a DevOps mentality for deploying these things, right? You just want to be as much possible should be API driven or at least highly integrate with the UI. Um, and uh, you also want to worry about security, right? Where in part this means building security based on segmentation into your network infrastructure. In part, this means having certain basic infrastructure services, such as you know, firewalling and, and the visibility and tapping built into the, the, the just of your, your, your networking platform. Um, but a lot of it will actually be inserting services from third parties into this. So another thing we're doing with NSX is giving you the ability to say, take a Palo Alto Networks firewall and plug it somewhere in between. Right? Somebody wants to take a mobile device to talk to Amazon, you can now insert an, uh, uh, you know, Palo Alto Networks firewall in the middle. In the future, we'll have that, that capability. Because that's really part of managing this, this overall equation. All right, that's actually all I had here. And I uh, wanted to open up for questions. If there are questions. And there's two microphones, so please uh, use those if, uh, if you have anything. Yes, please. Uh, so you talk about the overlay and the underlay. Uh, so the flexibility of overlay is obvious, but it sort of the complexity is times two, right? So do you see any hope that uh, with in the foreseeable future that yeah. the underlay and the overlay network can be sort of optimized and controlled by a single control plane, or or you don't see this as a legitimate use case for a typical enterprise because you can just have a very yeah. fat underlay and be done with it. So I. Look, again, the, the having you know, I mean, the overlay over an overlay over an overlay, right? Uh, that, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. I mean, it makes sense to me in terms of having three administrative domains that influence network policy, but hopefully on the wire, we're going to have one header or, or worst case two, but certainly not three, right? I think we're, uh, we're starting to see solutions. For example, NSX, you know, you can plug that into your container solution, but a container and the, you know, the, sort of your, your, your application developer uses one set of APIs to build networks, and then your IT folks use another set of APIs. But at the end of the day, how it is actually implemented and enforced is all coming from one platform, right? Uh, or you know, we, do, we have some integrations, for example, with some of the hardware folks. You know, if I mean, if you, if you look at the capabilities of a big switch, right, and you look at the capabilities of, of an NSX, uh, it's it's very natural to put them together, do a little bit of UI integration, so you can actually say, okay, I'm, uh, you know, if the big switch guys run the fabric, right? You know, we run the the overlay network. But uh, for example, if you're trying to debug something, we give you one coherent view that shows you everything, right? So I think I, I, I'm with you there. I think we, we need to get to a point where this is more integrated. It's going to take a little bit of time, but, but we'll get there. Thanks. Yes. Good afternoon, Guido. Scott Fulton with the new stack. Uh, I'm sorry, who are you with? with? The new stack. Oh, the new stack. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Throughout this conference, uh, we've seen NFV, network functions virtualization, mm -hmm. as a yeah. major emerging theme. And there are two prevalent points of view on this. One, which comes from AT&T, which is NFV will help refine the way all of OpenStack does networking, and that over time we will see the benefits of NFV trickle down throughout the enterprise. It's depending on whom you ask at AT&T, it could be two years, it could be four years, but it will happen. They see this as an inevitability. The other view is that NFV is a completely different way of of networking and orchestrating workloads in that network yeah. than you would have in an enterprise because the needs of orchestrating traffic uh, are different and scale differently than the needs of orchestrating resources. Does VMware have a viewpoint on this? Do you have a viewpoint on this? OK, uh, it's two different questions, I guess. But um, let me see. In, in terms of what I'm seeing coming as requirements from, from the carrier community versus the enterprise community. I would say, at the moment, it's, I see more of a divergence than a convergence. Does that make sense, right? This doesn't mean you can't build one solution that addresses both, but it means you need a, a somewhat different feature set for, for the two things, right? The you know, a second thing is that I think in the enterprise, my impression is, you know, at least certain types of, of 
network virtualization have become mainstream, right? On the, the NFV side, I think we're a little early in the process, right? The, and I think there's some of the architectures that I see make sense to me. Some of the architectures that are out there, I, I still haven't quite reconciled how this is going to work in reality. Right? And um, so if, if I have to guess, I would expect them to be somewhat different. Um, Very good. Thanks, sir. Cool. Any more questions? Oh, here we go. I was just wondering if you had a view on how NDN, CCN, you know, those technologies will drive SDN evolution. Like name data networking, content centric networking. Yeah, so the, the so I mean, the, if I understand correctly, you're asking about this idea to say, let's embed richer information to pack a header, packet headers that describe what this traffic is about and then sort of make networking forwarding elements more aware of, of how to deal with you know, data based on, on, on a much richer set of parameters. Is that an accurate description? Right. Yeah, okay. So uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, I'm personally a skeptic, and, and let, let me explain why, right? The, when networking was fully distributed, meaning when every switch was operating all by itself with basically no central management or, or operations, right, or, or control, um, we had to embed lots of information into the protocols, right? Uh, just in order to carry state between them, right? We needed what was it, synchronized state like BGP, but we also needed to put in information like like QoS bits or so to basically say, okay, this this type of information, you know, handle in a certain way as it as it travels down, you know, the um, the the network. Um, and and you know, this was actually uh, posed a lot of challenges because we need to do this at, on all switches at the same time. Otherwise, we don't get interoperable solutions, right? And so that's why I think classic networking often starts with the idea. This is really about designing protocols first, right? And then I think about what's the application state model behind it. Now, the way SDN is typically implemented is that it's implemented with at least a central management plane, in many cases a centralized control plane, right? So the moment you have a centralized control plane where basically you have one server that has perfect visibility into everything that's happening in your network, these things become different, right? Because now I know that this particular flow, right, should be, should have a certain quality of service. Instead of carrying the information that this should have, you know, the, the, of the properties about the flow, in the packet header for every hop, I can just push this out centrally and tell every switch, look, this traffic is coming, right, this is how we can identify it, and this is how we should handle it, right? So we no longer need the data plane to exchange this information, we can now do it via the control plane, right? And I'm probably a little biased here from my OpenStack history, but, but uh, I think that is the, the right way of doing things in the future, right? So instead of, you, you still probably want um, protocols that are richer, that have richer headers to, you know, at the hand of points, right? So basically if I'm running, you know, here's I'm, uh, uh, you know, an, an OpenStack cloud I'm running with, with a, uh, some kind of network virtualization overlay, I have an edge somewhere where this may go over into the hardware world, right? At that edge, these protocols make sense to me. Inside, you know, we can do these things directly through the control plane. I think it's architecturally a much better solution. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. <laughs> so the centralized control plane scales to an enterprise, but can it scale to the internet? And do you think NDN and CCN can help achieve that scale? So uh, I, I think no. <laughs> Maybe today, look, scaling control planes for networking is unbelievably hard, right? I mean, we, we it took us. Three tries at Big Switch to get this right. It took us them three tries at in the server before they got it right, right? And and it's 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 really one of the hardest engineering problems I've seen. Um, you know, most SDN systems I've seen are scaling limited by their control plane, right? And then that's you try to scale as high as you can, but you just at some point you can't anymore. I think stop breaking. Um, so, you know, can you do something of internet size today? Absolutely not, right? I mean, maybe management definitely not control. Right? Um, is this the right way of doing things? This would be a pretty big failure domain, right? I mean, <laughs> I would feel very uncomfortable with that. I mean, even large customers deploying, for example, NSX today typically shard the system, right? And saying like, look, I'm, I'm you know, using 10,000 virtual machines at a time or so, but, but then I'm, I'm gonna create something self-contained, fairly isolated, just, you know, after that, it, it just uh, doesn't make sense to scale anymore. Um, even if totally you're running over 100,000. So I think, the, the, the better approach is to federate between different centralized control planes, right? And, and you know, today we're doing that with things like BGP or OSPF. I think if you would take a, you know, a, a smart PhD on, on databases and give them a problem saying, we have one router and another router and they want to exchange routing databases, 
today, knowing everything you know, we've learned since BGP was invented, we would probably hopefully de develop something much better than, than, than BGP, right? Something actually synchronizes and just not just blasts out updates. Um, so I think there's room there for new types of protocols, right? And, and there these, you know, these, these protocols could be interesting. Um, but no, I don't think we'll ever have a centralized you know, United Nations control plane uh, for, uh, for all of the internet. Thank you. Good. No more questions. Well, then, uh, thank you very much. And if you uh, want to talk to me privately, I'll be around after this. Thanks. Mm -hmm.